How is your money blueprint conditioned? Your programming leads to your thoughts, your thoughts lead to your feelings, your feelings lead to your actions, your actions lead to your results. Therefore, just as is done with a personal computer, by by changing your programming, you take the first essential step to changing your results. So how are we conditioned? We are conditioned in three primary ways in every arena of life, including money, verbal programming, what did you hear when you were young? Modeling, what did you see when you were young? Specific incidents, what did you experience when you were young? The three aspects of conditioning are important to understand, so let's go over each of them. In part 2 of this book, you will learn how to recondition yourself for wealth and success. The first influence, verbal programming, what did you hear about money, wealth, and rich people when you were growing up? Did you ever hear phrases like money are the root of all evil, save your money for a rainy day, rich people are greedy, rich people are criminals? Filthy rich, you have to work hard to make money, money doesn't grow on trees, you can't be rich and spiritual, money doesn't buy happiness, money talks, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, that's not for people like us, not everyone can be rich, there's never enough, and the infamous we can't afford it. In my household. Every time I asked my father for any money I'd hear him scream, What am I made of? Money. Jokingly I'd respond, I wish. I'll take an arm, a hand, even a finger. He never laughed once. Here's the rub. All the statements you heard about money when you were young remain in your subconscious mind as part of the blueprint that is running your financial life. Verbal conditioning is extremely powerful. For example, when my son, Jesse, was three years old, he ran over to me and excitedly said, Daddy, let's go see the Ninja Turtle movie. It's playing near us. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out how this toddler could already be a master of geography. A couple of hours later, I got my answer in the form of a TV commercial advertising the movie, which had at the end the usual tagline, now playing at a theater near you. Another example of the power of verbal conditioning came at the expense of one of our Millionaire Mind seminar participants. Stephen didn't have a problem earning money his challenge was keeping it. At the time Stephen came to the course he was earning over $800,000 a year and had been doing so for the past nine years. Yet he was still barely scraping by. Somehow, he managed to spend his money, lend it, or lose it all by making poor investment decisions. Whatever the reason, his net worth was exactly zero. Stephen shared with us that when he was growing up, his mom always used to say, rich people, are greedy. They make their money off the sweat of the poor. You should have just enough to get by. After that, you're a pig. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what was going on inside Stephen's subconscious mind. No wonder he was broke. He was verbally conditioned by his mother to believe that rich people are greedy. Therefore, his mind is linked up rich with greed which of course is bad. Since he didn't want to be bad, subconsciously he couldn't be rich. Stephen loved his mom and didn't want her to disapprove of him. Obviously, based on her beliefs, if he were to get rich, she wouldn't approve. Therefore, 
the only thing for him to do was to get rid of any extra money beyond just getting by, otherwise, he'd be a pig. Now, you would think that in choosing between being rich and being approved of by mom or anyone else for that matter, most people would take being rich. Not a chance. The mind just doesn't work that way. Sure, riches would seem to be the logical choice. But when the subconscious mind must choose between deeply rooted emotions and logic, emotions will almost always win. Wealth Principle When the subconscious mind must choose between deeply rooted emotions and logic, emotions will almost always win. Let's get back to our story. In less than 10 minutes at the course, using some extremely effective experiential techniques, Stephen's money blueprint changed dramatically. In only two years, he went from being broke to becoming a millionaire. At the course, Stephen began to understand that these non-supportive beliefs were his mom's, based on her past programming, and not his. We then took it a step further and helped him to create a strategy whereby he wouldn't lose his mother's approval if he got rich. It was simple. His mom loved Hawaii. So Stephen invested in a beachfront condo on Maui. He sends her there for the entire winter. She's in heaven, and so is he. First. She now loves that he's rich and tells everyone how generous he is. Second, he doesn't have to deal with her for six months of the year. Brilliant. In my own life, after a slow start, I began doing well in business but never seemed to make money with my stocks. In becoming aware of my money blueprint, I recalled that when I was young, each day after work, my dad would sit down at the dinner table with the newspaper, check the stock pages, slam his fist on the table, and shout, those stinking stocks. He then spent the next half hour ranting about how stupid the whole system is and how you have a better chance of making money playing the slot machines in Las Vegas. Now that you understand the power of verbal conditioning, can you see that it's no wonder I couldn't make any money in the stock market? I was literally programmed to fail, programmed to unconsciously pick the wrong stock, at the wrong price, at the wrong time. Why? To subconsciously validate my money blueprint that said, stocks stink. All I can say is, by digging out this massive, toxic weed from my inner financial garden, I began getting inundated with more fruits. Virtually the day after I reconditioned myself, the stocks I chose began to boom, and I've continued to have amazing success in the stock market ever since. It seems incredibly strange. But when you really understand how the money blueprint works, it makes perfect sense. Again, your subconscious conditioning determines your thinking. Your thinking determines your decisions, and your decisions determine your actions, which eventually determine your outcomes. There are four key elements of change, each of which is essential in reprogramming your financial blueprint. They are simple but profoundly powerful. The first element of change is awareness. You can't change something unless you know it exists. The second element of change is understanding. By understanding where your way of thinking originates, you can recognize that it has to come from outside you. The third element of change is disassociation. Once you realize this way of thinking isn't you, you can separate yourself from it and choose in the present whether to keep it or let it go based on who you are today, 
and where you want to be tomorrow. You can observe this way of thinking and see it for what it is, a file of information that was stored in your mind a long, long time ago and may not hold any truth or value for you anymore. The fourth element of change is reconditioning. We will begin this process in part two of this book, where we will introduce you to the mental files that generate wealth. Should you want to take this a step further, I invite you to attend the Millionaire Mind Intensive Seminar, where you will be led through a series of powerful experiential techniques that will rewire your subconscious on a cellular and permanent level retraining your mind to respond supportively in terms of money and success. Meanwhile, Let's go back to our discussion on verbal conditioning and the steps you can take now to begin revising your money blueprint. Steps for change, verbal programming awareness, write down all the statements you heard about money, wealth, and rich people when you were young. Understanding, write down how you believe these statements have affected your financial life so far. Disassociation, can you see that these thoughts represent only what you learned and are not part of your anatomy and not who you are? Can you see that you have a choice in the present moment to be different? Declaration, place your hand over your heart and say. What I heard about money isn't necessarily true. I choose to adopt new ways of thinking that support my happiness and success. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. The second influence, modeling. The second way we are conditioned is called modeling. What were your parents or guardians like in the arena of money when you were growing up? Did one or both of them manage their money well or did they mismanage it? Were they spenders or savers? Were they shrewd investors or were they non-investors? Were they risk takers or conservative? Was money consistently there or was the flow more sporadic? Did the money come easily in your family, or was it always a struggle? Was money a source of joy in your household or the cause of bitter arguments? Why is this information important? You've probably heard the saying monkey see, monkey do. Well, humans aren't far behind. As kids, we learn just about everything from modeling. Although most of us would hate to admit it. There's more than a grain of truth in the old saying the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. This reminds me of the story about a woman who prepares a ham for dinner by cutting off both ends. Her bewildered husband asks why she cuts off the ends. She replies that's how my mom cooked it. Well. It just so happened that her mom was coming for dinner that night. So they asked her why she cut off the ends of the ham. Mom replies that's how my mom cooked it. So they decide to call grandma on the phone and ask why she cut off the ends of the ham. Her answer. Because my pen was too small. The point is that generally speaking. We tend to be identical to one or a combination of our parents in the arena of money. For example, my dad was an entrepreneur. He was in the home building business. He built anywhere from a dozen to a hundred homes per project. Each project took a huge amount of capital investment. My dad would have to put up everything we had and borrow heavily from the bank until the homes were sold and the cash came through. Consequently, at the beginning of each project, we had no money and were in debt up to our eyeballs. As you can imagine, 
During this period my dad was not in the best of moods nor was generosity his strong suit. If I asked him for anything that cost even a penny, his standard reply after the usual what am I, made of money, was are you crazy? Of course, I wouldn't get a dime, but what I would get was that don't even think of asking again glare. I'm sure you know the one. This scenario would last for about a year or two until the homes were finally sold. Then, we'd be rolling in dough. All of a sudden, my dad was a different person. He'd be happy, kind, and extremely generous. He'd come over and ask me if I needed a few bucks. I felt like giving him his glare back. But I wasn't that stupid so I just said, sure, dad, thanks, and rolled my eyes. Life was good. Until that dreaded day when he'd come home and announce, that I found a good piece of land. We're going to build again. I distinctly remember saying, great, dad, good luck, as my heart sank knowing the struggle that was about to unfold again. This pattern lasted from the time I could remember, when I was about six, until the age of 21 when I moved out of my parents' house for good. Then it stopped, or so I thought. At 21 years of age, I finished school and became, you guessed it, a builder. I then went on to several other types of project-based businesses. For some strange reason, I'd make a small fortune, but just a short time later, I'd be broke. I'd get into another business and believe I was on top of the world again, only to hit bottom a year later. This up and down pattern went on for nearly 10 years before I realized that maybe the problem wasn't the type of business I was choosing, the partners I was choosing, the employees I had, the state of the economy, or my decision to take time off and relax when things were going well. I finally recognized that maybe, just maybe. I was unconsciously reliving my dad's up and down income pattern. All I can say is, thank goodness I learned what you're learning in this book and was able to recondition myself out of that yo-yo model and into having a consistently growing income. Today, the urge to change when things are going well, and to sabotage me in the process, still comes up. But now, there's another file in my mind that observes this feeling and says, thank you for sharing now let's get refocused and back to work. Another example comes from one of my seminars in Orlando, Florida. As usual, people were filing up to the stage, one by one, to get an autograph and say hello or thank you or whatever. I'll never forget one older gentleman because he came up sobbing. He could barely catch his breath and kept wiping his tears with his sleeve. I asked him what was wrong. He said, I'm 63 years old and I've been reading books and going to seminars since they were invented. I've seen every speaker and tried everything they taught. I've tried stocks, and real estate, and been in over a dozen different businesses. I went back to university and got an MBA. I've got more knowledge than 10 average men, yet I've never made it financially. I'd always get a good start but end up empty-handed, and in all those years I never knew why. I thought I must just be plain old stupid until today. Finally, after listening to you and doing the processes, it all makes sense. There's nothing wrong with me. I just had my dad's money blueprint stuck in my head and that's been my nemesis. 
my dad went through the heart of the Depression era. Every day he would try getting jobs or selling things and come home empty-handed. I wish I would have understood modeling and money patterns 40 years ago. What a waste of time, all that learning and knowledge has been. He began to cry even harder. I replied, no way is your knowledge a waste of time. It has just been latent, waiting in a A-mind bank, waiting for the opportunity to come out. Now that you've formulated a, a success blueprint, everything you've ever learned will become usable and you will skyrocket to success. For most of us, when we hear the truth, we know it. He started to lighten you up and began breathing deeply again. Then a big grin came across his face. He gave me the biggest hug and said, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Last I heard from him, everything was booming, he has accumulated more wealth in the last 18 months than in the past 18 years combined. I love it. Again, you can have all the knowledge and skills in the world, but if your blueprint isn't set for success, you're financially doomed. We often get seminar participants whose parents were involved in World War II or who lived through the Depression. These people are often in shock when they realize how much their parents' experiences have influenced their beliefs and habits around money. Some spend like crazy because you could easily lose all your money, so you might as well enjoy it while you can. Others go the opposite route, they hoard their money and save for a rainy day. A word of wisdom, saving for a rainy day might sound like a good idea, but it can create big problems. One of the principles we teach in another of our courses is the power of intention. If you are saving your money for a rainy day, what are you going to get? Rainy days. Stop doing that. Instead of saving for a rainy day, focus on saving for a joyous day or for the day you win your financial freedom, then. By virtue of the law of intention, that's exactly what you will get. Earlier we said that most of us tend to be identical to one or both parents in the arena of money, but there's also the flip side of the coin. Some of us end up being exactly the opposite of one or both parents. Why would that happen? Do the words anger and rebellion ring a bell? In short, it just depends on how ticked off you were at, them. Unfortunately, as little kids, we can't say to our parents, mom and dad, have a seat. I'd like to discuss something with you. I'm not fond of the way you're managing your money or, for that matter, your lives, and therefore, when I become an adult. I'll be doing things quite differently. I hope you understand. Good night now and pleasant dreams. No, 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 it doesn't go quite that way. Instead, when our buttons are pushed, we generally freak out and what comes out sounds more like I hate you. I'll never be like you. When I grow up. I'm gonna be rich. Then I'll get whatever I want whether you like it or not. Then we run to our bedroom, slam the door, and start pounding our pillow or whatever else is at hand, to vent our frustration. Many people who come from poor families become angry and rebellious about it. Often they either go out and get rich or at least have the motivation to do so. But there's one little hiccup, which is actually a big burp. Whether such people get rich or work their buns off trying to become successful, 
they are not usually happy. Why? Because the root of their wealth or motivation for money is anger and resentment. Consequently, money and anger become linked in their minds, and the more money such individuals have or strive for, the angrier they get. Eventually, the higher self says, I'm tired of being angry and stressed out. I just want to be peaceful and happy. So they ask the same mind that created the link what to do about this situation. To which their mind answers, if you want to get rid of your anger, you're going to have to get rid of your money. So they do. They subconsciously get rid of their money. They overspend or make poor investment decisions or get a financially disastrous divorce, or sabotage their success in some other way. But no matter, because now these folks are happy. Right? Wrong. Things are even worse because now they're not just angry, they're broke and angry. They got rid of the wrong thing. They got rid of the money instead of the anger, the fruit instead of the root. Meanwhile, the real issue is, and always was, the anger between them and their parents. And until that anger is resolved, they will never be truly happy or peaceful regardless of how much money they have or don't have. The reason or motivation you have for making money or creating success is vital. If your motivation for acquiring money or success comes from a non-supportive route such as fear, anger, or the need to prove yourself, your money will never bring you happiness. Wealth Principle If your motivation for acquiring money or success comes from a non-supportive route such as fear, anger, or the need to prove yourself, your money will never bring you happiness. Why? Because you can't solve any of these issues with money. Take fear, for instance. During my seminars, I ask the audience, how many of you would cite fear as your primary motivation for success? Not many people put up their hands. However, then I ask, how many of you would cite security as one of your main motivators for success? Almost everyone puts up his or her hand. But get these a security and fear are both motivated by the same thing. Seeking security comes from insecurity, which is based on fear. So, will more money dissolve the fear? you wish. But the answer is absolutely not. Why? Because money is not the root of the problem fear is. What's even worse is that fear is not just a problem, it's a habit. Therefore, making more money will only change the kind of fear we have. When we were broke, we were most likely afraid we'd never make it or never have enough. Once we make it, however, our fear usually changes to what if I lose what I've made? Or everyone's going to want what I have or I'm going to get creamed in taxes. In short, until we get to the root of this issue and dissolve the fear, no amount of money will help. Of course. Given a choice, most of us would rather worry about having money and losing it than not having money at all, but neither are overly enlightened ways to live. As with those of us driven by fear, many people are motivated to achieve financial success to prove they are good enough. We'll cover this challenge in detail in part 2 of this book, but for now. Just realize that no amount of money can ever make you good enough. Money can't make you something you already are. Again, as with fear, always having to prove yourself issue becomes your habitual way of living.
You don't even recognize it's running you. You call your self a high achiever, a hard driver, determined, and all these traits are fine. The only question is why? What is the root engine that drives all this? For people who are driven to prove they are good enough, no amount of money can ease the pain of that inner wound that makes everything and everyone in their life, not enough. No amount of money, or anything else for that matter, will ever be enough for people who feel they are not good enough themselves. Again, it's all about you. Remember, your inner world reflects your outer world. If you believe you are not enough, you will validate that belief and create the reality that you don't have enough. On the other hand, if you believe you are plenty, you will validate that belief and create plenty of abundances. Why? Because plenty will be your root which will then become your natural way of being. By unlinking your money motivation from anger, fear, and the need to prove yourself, you can install new links for earning your money through purpose, contribution, and joy. That way, you'll never have to get rid of your money to be happy. Being a rebel or the opposite of your parents is not always a problem. On the contrary, if you were a rebel, often the case with second-born children, and your folks had poor money habits, it's probably a good thing that you are their opposite. On the other hand, if your parents were successful and you're rebelling against them, you could be in for serious financial difficulties. Either way. What's important is to recognize how your way of being related to one or both of your parents in the arena of money. Steps for change, modeling awareness, consider the ways of being and habits of each of your parents had around money and wealth. Write down how you may be identical or opposite to either of them. Understanding Write down the effect of this modeling has had on your financial life. Disassociation, can you see this way of being is only what you learned and isn't you? Can you see you have a choice in the present moment to be different? Declaration, place your hand over your heart and say, what I modeled around money was their way. I choose my way. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. The third influence, specific incidents. The third primary way in which we are conditioned is by specific incidents. What did you experience when you were young around money, wealth, and rich people? These experiences are extremely important because they shape the beliefs or rather, the illusions you now live by. Let me give you an example. A woman who was an operating room nurse attended the Millionaire Mind Intensive Seminar. Josie had an excellent income, but somehow she always spent all of her money. When we dug a little deeper, she revealed that when she was 11 years old, she remembers being at a Chinese restaurant with her parents and her sister. Her mom and dad were having yet another bitter argument about money. Her dad was standing up, screaming and slamming his fist on the table. She remembers him turning red, then blue, then falling to the floor from a heart attack. She was on the swim team at school and had CPR training, which she administered, but to no avail. Her father died in her arms. And so, from that day forth, Josie's mind linked money with pain. It's no wonder then that as an adult, she subconsciously got rid of all of her money in an effort to get rid of her pain. It's also interesting to note that she became a nurse. Why? 
Is it possible that she was still trying to save her dad? At the course, we helped Josie identify her old money blueprint and revise it. Today she is well on her way to becoming financially free. She is also not a nurse anymore. Not that she didn't enjoy her job. It's just that she was in the nursing profession for the wrong reason. She's now a financial planner, still helping people, but this time one-on-one, -on -one, to understand how their past programming runs every aspect of their financial lives. Let me give you another example of a specific incident, one that's closer to home. When my wife was eight years old, she would hear the clanging bells of the ice cream truck coming down the street. She would run to her mom and ask for a quarter. Her mom would reply, Sorry, dear, I don't have any money. Go ask dad. Dad's got all the money. My wife would then go ask her dad. He'd give her a quarter. She'd go get her ice cream cone, and she was a happy camper. Week after week, the same incident would repeat itself. So what did my wife learn about money? First, men have all the money. So once we got married, what do you think she expected of me? That's right, money. And I'll tell you what. She wasn't asking for quarters anymore. Somehow she'd graduated. Second, she learned that women don't have money. If her mom, the deity, didn't have money, obviously this is the way she should be. To validate that way of being, she would subconsciously get rid of all her money. She was quite precise about it too. If you gave her $100, she'd spend $100. If you gave her $200, she'd spend $200. If you gave her $500, she'd spend $500, and if you gave her $1,000, she'd spend $1,000. Then she took one of my courses and learned all about the art of leverage. I gave her $2,000, she spent $10,000. I tried to explain, no, honey, leverage means we're the ones who are supposed to get the $10,000, not spend it. Somehow it just wasn't sinking in. The only thing we ever fought about was money. It almost cost us our marriage. What we didn't know at the time was that the meanings each of us attributed to money were radically different. To my wife, money meant immediate pleasure, as in enjoying her ice cream. I, on the other hand, grew up with the belief that money was meant to be accumulated as the means to create freedom. As far as I was concerned, whenever my wife spent money, she wasn't spending money, she was spending our future freedom. And as far as she was concerned, whenever I held her back from spending, I was taking away her pleasure in life. Thank goodness we learned how to revise each of our money blueprints and, more importantly, create a third money blueprint specifically for the relationship. Does all this work? Let me put it this way I've witnessed three miracles in my life, 1. The birth of my daughter. 2. The birth of my son. 3. My wife and I not fighting about money anymore. Statistics show that the number one cause of all relationship breakups is money. The biggest reason behind the fights people have about money is not the money itself, but the mismatch of their blueprints. It doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. 
If your blueprint doesn't match that of the person you're dealing with, you'll have a major challenge. This goes for married couples, dating couples, family relationships, and even business associates. The key is to comprehend that you are dealing with blueprints, not money. Once you recognize a person's money blueprint, you can deal with your partner in a way that works for both of you. You can begin by becoming aware that your partner's money files are probably not the same as yours. Instead of getting upset, choose understanding. Do your best to find out what's important to your partner in the arena of money and identify his or her motivations and fears. In this way, you'll be dealing with the roots instead of the fruits and have a good shot at making it work. Otherwise, no way, Jose. One of the most important things you will learn, should you decide to attend the Millionaire Mind Intensive Seminar, is how to recognize your partner's money blueprint as well as how to create a brand new blueprint between both of you that helps you as partners get what you really want. It is truly a blessing to be able to do this as it alleviates one of the biggest causes of pain for most people. Steps for change, specific incidents, here's an exercise you can do with your partner. Sit down and discuss the history each of you brings to your thoughts about money what you heard when you were young, what was modeled in your family, and any emotional incidents that occurred. Also, Find out what money really means to your partner. Is it pleasure or freedom or security or status? This will assist you in identifying each other's current money blueprint and may help you discover why you might be disagreeing in this arena. Next, discuss what you want today not as individuals, but as a partnership. Decide and agree upon your general goals and attitudes with regard to money and success. Then create a list of these attitudes and actions you both agree to live by and write them down. Post them on the wall, and if ever there's an issue, gently, very gently, remind each other what you decided together when you were both objective, unemotional and outside the grip of your old money blueprints. Awareness, consider a specific emotional incident you experienced around money when you were young. Understanding, write down how this incident may have affected your current financial life. Disassociation, can you see this way of being is only what you learned and isn't you? Can you see you have a choice in the present moment to be different? Declaration, place your hand on your heart and say. I release my non-supportive money experiences from the past and create a new and rich future. Touch your head and say. I have a millionaire mind. Thank you, soon I will come back with the next part. If you liked this video then please like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks and have a nice day. Bye.